high. I'm definitely not hunching because now I feel criticized. <laughs> Called out. I'm sorry. That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are being perceived. <laughs> Live from New York, being perceived. <laughs> Please do. Oh, sorry. Did I do something? No. Is no. the door locked? Yep. Okay. Um, I can sit in front of it. Okay. Five, four, three, two. Oh. I like the pose. You got me <laughs> off guard with that. <laughs> Welcome back to Metropolis. It is March 6th, 2024. I'm your host, Calden Rongder Datsimpa. Uh, today, I am joined again by Drew Oyaje, the uh, executive director of CUTV, publisher at The Breach. How are you doing today, Drew? I'm doing great. Lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Thank you for coming on. Uh, we got a nice nice agenda ahead of us for topics. We're going to be talking about Denny Cadell, stuff he's saying. We're going to be talking about carjackings in Montreal, mm-hmm. how to do it. <laughs> and then we got... Dune too. Was... The full range of, of Denny's, the yeah, full yeah, spectrum yeah. of Quebec Quebec based Denny uh, people. I wish I wish the valley like I wish I could talk about the car theft stuff through a Denny lens just so we could have like a Denny 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 thing, but mm-hmm. doesn't doesn't always work like that. So yeah, let's um I have a clip here of uh former Montreal mayor Denny Coder. Uh he's sort of still in the public sphere making comments here and there recently he's sort of um there's sort of talks about how he's eyeing the liberal party leadership seat yeah he's, since, he's biding his time yeah yeah but he hasn't like confirmed it yet so i think he's just sort of like testing the waters testing the waters massaging the masses you know um anyways he was on a uh he was on a show on uh, he was on montreal now with uh Aaron Rand on CJAD recently. Uh, he had some stuff to say about uh, Bill Twenty One, uh, and I have a clip for us. Let's roll it. Let's roll it. So, uh, on that point, then, Denis, if you were Premier of Quebec, if you were Premier of Quebec, what would you do with Bill Twenty One? I would keep it. I would keep it because it's... and you would keep the notwithstanding clause. Be- yes, of course, and I would apply it if I need to. So you would keep Bill Twenty One. You're for Bill Twenty One. I, I'm no. I'm for the fact that a pr- prime minister and a national assembly has the right, to, and Doug Ford did it too. I no, mean, I understand. I'm not. I'm not disputing the right to use the notwithstanding clause. What I'm saying is, let's say 2026, you're the premier of Quebec. What do you do with Bill 21? You said yourself that there's a popular, and you know, since the 60s when we had the Quiet Revolution, mm-hmm. we decided to make a split between the church and the state. Yes. And and Bill Twenty One is about that, and there's a consensus. And if it wasn't right, I mean, why the hell the CAC one ninety six that that's election? All I'm saying is that you're if if you were forming the next government, I would focus, you I would, would have the 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 notwithstanding clause would run out. So would you renew it? Would you keep Bill Twenty One as is? Would you renew Bill Twenty uh, the the notwithstanding clause? For I would Bill keep 21? it because I would focus more on the language issue than on the kind of society you want to live in as a second versus uh, uh, a religious one. All right. So there we have it. Denis Coderre on uh, Montreal Now talking about how he would keep Bill 21, Mm -hmm. renew the notwithstanding clause, and he would prefer to keep the debate about language rather than religious or secular society. Um, What do you think about this, Drew? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think, first of all, before I start saying a lot of negative things about Denis Coderre, I just want to acknowledge that he's a talented politician. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, he knows he knows what he's doing. He's he's acting with very intentionally, very strategically. The, w- the way he frames things, like later on in this interview, he says, uh, uh, I'm in the kitchen, I'm not in the lounge. You know, and it's this very evocative image, which of course is an absurd distinction, but but it but it but it but it really sticks with you. You know, it's like I'm a, in the basement, not the mudroom. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like an earworm of political discourse. Um, so so I just yeah, I just wanted to sort of put that out up front. Sure, but sure, sure, but sure, sure. I think what he's doing here is he's he's currently testing the waters. No secret, he's testing the waters to potentially run for leadership of the Quebec. Liberal Party, and I think that he, if he does do that, 
it'll be because he thinks he can be become premier of Quebec. Mm-hmm. Um, so right now what he's doing is he's sort of teeing himself up as, as they put it on one of the, the, um, Luke Ferrandez, I think referred to it as Capitan Canada. And, and that Captain Canada has like shown up in a, without not accidentally, of Go course, ahead. in a bunch of articles, uh, about what he's been doing. He launched this, uh, movement, uh, soi disant, um, called No Merci. Um, that's pretty much just, we don't want to have a referendum. Mm-hmm. So he's trying to take a position of saying we can we're 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 better off economically within Canada. We can protect your language rights, um, but the problem that he would face if if he sort of took that position, which I think has been popular in the past, has has won majorities in the past, mm-hmm. remains to be seen whether it'll win majorities in the future. The position being. Pro Canada, basically, sure, 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 um, sure. the Liberal Party position, which is like we're a strong Quebecois province within Canada, yeah. and that's that. Um, and we don't want a referendum. We don't want this like mm-hmm. big division happening. Um, but we're still going to be, we're still going to have our distinct policies and so on. Um, well, not not really, uh, because the Liberal Party has been extremely, um, how shall we put it? Um, austere of course uh, in its economic policies sure, sure. um and you know has has basically tried to gut the gut the welfare state whenever it can i guess distinct from their perspective on like maybe like language issues or i think th- they're referendum. very much in favor and and this, um, this is getting to the point that i'm about to make which is or that that then he's making in this interview which is that the appearance of being distinct is really the more important thing mm-hmm. um what he's saying here is he's speaking to the anglophone community basically the the like anglophone base of Mm -hmm. the liberal party and saying okay if i'm going to be leader you're going to have to tone it down you're going to have to stop playing into this culture war where it's um you know uh cultural diversity uh and the anglos on one side and um white quebecers and Quebec identity on the other sure. um, because that is a recipe I think in his mind at least for electoral defeat mm-hmm. um, and and so he doesn't want to have to to go he doesn't want to have to fly that flag of course um, I guess he's sort of speaking to the uh, the West Island base because right now the Liberal Party of uh, Quebec they're like what, like fourth the fourth party uh, in in the legislature most of mm-hmm. that is all in the West Island, so I guess it's mm-hmm. speaking to them specifically, right? If you're talking about like yeah. that, they need to tone it down. They need to kind of choose maybe another uh, uh, another program. Yeah, I, and and I think he what the message that he's sending is, I'm, I I don't have to do this. I don't have to do this, but if I'm going to do it, here's the condi- You know, mm-hmm. he, he's waiting for a signal back. He's throwing up a trial balloon, basically, mm-hmm. um, and. The problem with that, from my perspective, is that, um, you know, I think it runs the risk of consolidating the sort of ethnic identitarianism behind Bill 21. This Mm -hmm. is effectively an Islamophobic, um, you know, by another name, but, Mm -hmm. but, 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 but but feeding into and drawing on the sort of um, xenophobia and specifically Islamophobia. And the problem with Islamophobia in Quebec is that it has a, there's a death toll associated with it. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, you know, um, it's not, we're, we're playing with fire, uh, when we're encouraging that kind of thing. Um, on the other hand, I could see trying to take it off the table as a hot button issue as a way to, I mean, I'm sure if he was premier, he would bring in on on a purely symbolic level, mind you, you know, different like you know he'd have some um, yeah, yeah, Mus- Muslim, sure. you know, member of the National Assembly, and they'd get some kind of um, symbolic job, right, right, because of like that kind of like organization, um, it would kind of take the heat off him for this sort of position he's taking now. But 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 that's the like hard limit on neoliberal politics. Sorry, not neoliberal. I promised I wouldn't use that word. And I have already, gotta get a I've, on I've the already I've already failed. Never, we'll put one down on the. But new what I meant to say counter. is liberal, specifically liberal, um, with a capital L. Yeah. Uh, politics is that you you do sort of you do the symbolic thing. You keep the status quo. Mm-hmm. You try to like 
you know, vaguely keep the social peace as long as there's not like a strike, then you crush it. Of course. Um, but, um, but you, you try to sort of keep this, um, multicultural, uh, hyper capitalism, um, where everyone's exploited, but, um, not at each other's throats too much. Yeah. 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 That, that, that's their MO. So, so, and you know, and I think that that's, I think the problem with that is that that's what got us here. Mm -hmm. That's what got us to the mosque shooting. That's what got us to, you know, people facing like all kinds of just like racism against, uh, this kind of liberal hyper capitalism you say is what kind of got us to this position. Yeah. I, I, um, because when people's conditions of life, um, deteriorate, Mm -hmm. um, you know, they feel it. Um, it's not an excuse for racism, but, but undeniably the, the, you know, if you're not going to address the economic circumstances that are making you unhappy, of course, then you need an outlet. Mm -hmm. So what's the outlet? And Quebec politicians have been very happy to go to racism as the outlet, right, right, racism, right. xenophobia, and so right, on. Right, It's like, let's say, like, oh, these economic conditions that we're in, this kind of, like, general, like, uh, malaise, this economic downturn, and the way that people feel it, instead of being like, this is actually, like, this capitalist system, and uh, mm-hmm. this is because of the capitalist system, it's actually because of immigrants. Yeah. Right? I guess we see that with, like, the CAC, right? The CAC is great at that, where they're talking about how the housing crisis, yeah. because of immigrants. And yeah, I, exactly. I, I guess, I guess it's, it's classic. Um, but, but, I mean, it, it goes back... You, Decades at this point too. Like when yeah. I first moved to Montreal in 2005, there were there was a really um, intense headline on the cover of the Journal de Montréal, which was at that point like one of the main sort of ways that people gauged news. Um, uh, you know, newspapers aren't really a thing anymore, but they were at that point. Um, and they had this big bold text headline. It was like 55% of Quebecers say they're racist, and it was like, why are they doing this? Yeah. Um, and we found out pretty quickly why they're doing it because, um, because that's the kind of discourse that you need to whip up uh, in order to distract from the fact that you're making you're objectively eroding people's like living conditions mm-hmm. and and increasing their their uh, decreasing their quality of life and increasing their cost of living mm-hmm. um, at the same time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're not going to address those things. By you know, I don't know, building social housing, raising wages, redistributing wealth, um, then you need you need to do something to distract people from the fact that you're not doing those a culture war. You need a culture war, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and you and so I guess you you're expecting Denis Coudet at the helm of the Liberal Party to sort of continue that culture war, but like I guess from a little bit of a different kind of. No, I think he'll continue to ignore the culture war and like try try to like have a, a superficial. Uh, unifying thing uh, and and basically try to get try to ignore the working class yeah um, the base of the liberal the liberal party is middle class people who um, have sort of aspirations of of and 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 see their well-being their economic well-being as connected to the economy sure so econo- so so when corporations get higher profits, they benefit right. because they're whatever, they're lawyers, they're middle managers, they're doctors, whatever they are, they're going to, they're going to benefit from that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and then, and then because the media will play ball with that and not say, Oh, well, the, what about the workers who are the majority? Mm-hmm. Um, like that, um, the, the, the whole liberal MO is to, is to ignore that is to, is to, is to keep, keep those issues to the side mm-hmm. uh, and just out of the discourse uh, and and make sure the main divisions are between. I mean, I think, yeah, the main division of, of Quebec for the last several decades has been sovereigntist, federalist. Mm-hmm. Um, and Denis Coderre wants to go right back to that because that is his, that's the liberal comfort zone mm-hmm. um, for not talking about economic issues and just letting corporations run, run the show. Right, right, right. I guess... I'm kind of curious how, so if, if you think the liberals are sort of like doing this kind of, um, if like we're talk, looking at the, this kind of culture war and on one side it's like liberals who are doing this kind of like symbolic kind of gestures of, uh, I guess, like representation and sort of like gesturing towards this kind of sort of like cultural, uh, like, uh, like a multiculturalism, right? And they're like, mm-hmm. this is all very well and good and we support this while ignoring the more material things. How do you think uh, conservatives or right-wingers kind of like, uh, how do they take the other side of that culture war? 
Oh, by leaning into identity. Right. Um, I mean, I mean, the sort of liberal identity is like, oh, yeah, we're the multicultural ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, can't we all just get along? Uh, as long as we don't talk about anything substantial, we'll sort of throw a bone here and there on a on a purely symbolic plane. I mean, this is Justin Trudeau to a to a T, right? right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, talk, make big promises, and then dole out symbolic concessions. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, you were we're not going to do the electoral reform that was the reason that a lot of people voted for us, um, but we will have a cabinet that's made up of 50% women, mm-hmm. um, which is a, an undeniable gain True, on the one of course, hand, of course. but, but it's not, uh, it's not going to, it, you know, at the same time rent went up by three times in Montreal. So right, right, right. there's limitations. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's going to be curious seeing, uh, I guess the direction of the liberal party from this sort of, I guess sort of bottom that they're at right now, right? They're kind of like a very historic low fourth party status. Be interesting to see uh, if Cadell does sort of take the helm where they're going to go with that, and also how he's going to, I guess, go up against uh, Legault because Legault is also kind of doing poorly in the in the polling, and yeah, it's sort of interesting seeing him, uh, seeing Denny Cadell take this sort of like, I'll say like a, a, a positive or not positive, but kind of like. He's not. He's not going against Bill Twenty One, right? Because it's like it's the sort of thing that's like immensely popular across the uh, province, just not really in Montreal, of course, which is like naturally mm-hmm. the more uh, diverse areas. It's kind of interesting seeing him trying to weave in between. I mean, what's been interesting to, to watch? So, so on the one hand, you have the rise of Quebec Solidaire, which is really the new, the new piece. Rise, that's part I guess, of the, rise in the last twenty years, but like they sort of hit a plateau since twenty eighteen. They made some minor gains the last time. They didn't like they were like doubling their seat count yeah, for yeah. like several elections, and then they stopped doing that yeah. um, because of the Lego uh, sort of juggernaut. Um, but nonetheless, them being on the scene is new in terms of like viable liberal governments. Like, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. so so three yeah three election cycles. So so basically, um, what's interesting about the Liberal Party is that it you sort of see how flimsy their sort of ideological suppositions are. Like when mm-hmm. they're out of power, they, they started having all this progressive rhetoric and mm-hmm. talking about, you know, redistributing wealth and like, you know, lots of progressive policies, of but you know, of course no one, no one really believed them and, and no one's conditioned to talk in those terms about Quebec politics anyway, because mm-hmm. um, we're still sort of beholden to the media and there hasn't, there hasn't been a, the you know labor movements and so on are not powerful enough to assert a different fundamental division, and so mm-hmm. now you have Coderre coming back, and I think what Quebec Solidaire very explicitly decided not to do was to um, try to transcend the um, the old division of um, sovereigntist versus federalist. Mm-hmm. They've completely stayed in that framework mm-hmm. because it was expedient in the short term. To bring on Option Nationale, which is another sort of sovereigntist, basically it was the same policies as Quebec Solidaire plus cultural nationalism. Right, right, right. Um, and so they were able to sort of bring that activist base in, and as a result, make make the leap to winning some seats in Quebec City. Mm-hmm. That was the big gain they got from that. But now they're firmly stuck in a sovereigntist, sovereignty first position, mm-hmm. which um, is is which means. It's going to be very, very difficult to get a majority because there's already one and a half other sovereignist parties that they're always going to be competing with. Sure. One of one of which is now, you know, has the potential to win a majority if yeah, there's an yeah, election. Yeah. They went from soon. went from like what two, three seats, and yeah. now they're like uh, really ahead in the polls. The PQ, led by uh, Paul so, Saint Pierre Plamondon. So, yeah, so so basically, we had this moment where it looked like actual economic progressivism could be on the agenda, but then we were we're now. Re- there's a real attempt on by everybody to revert just because it's like, it's easy. It's comfortable. Course, it's what yeah, we it's know. It's what we know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're not, we're not used to like, you know, having to like create a new coalition yeah. and new ways of talking about politics is hard. Uh, so, so everybody sort of including Quebec Solidaire, I think um, just reverted to talking about the old, the old way that we were used to for like several decades. Mm-hmm. And so now we're teeing ourselves up for another, you know, more the same referendum yeah. on referendum, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like a referendum on whether we'll have a referendum. That's basically yeah. the political divide now. Uh, and, and of course, you know, redistributive policies get, are what 
are the first at the chopping block when that's the that's the main division. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting seeing how that kind of comes up again. But Cod- yeah, Coderre is a, a, a talented politician, and I think he's he's trying to put the pieces in place. He he do- he clearly doesn't know if they're quite there yet, and and he doesn't want to. He's also kind of daring people, yeah. you know, to to defy him and, and say and make a big fuss about this mm-hmm. because this is a trial balloon. If if people if people do make a big fuss about this, and no, it's important to like that a liberal government overturn. Um, you know, Bill, Bill 21, 21 yeah. uh, and stop using the notwithstanding clause, which is um, such an absurd thing. Anyway, we wouldn't have to get into that. But <laughs> um, yeah, if you if you are going to make a fuss about it, well, I'll just I'll just back off. So he's sort mm-hmm. of he's playing chicken with with the sort of culture warriors. Yeah, I said the one was good. I mean, the, you had. Um, I mean, culture culture warriors. I don't mean that in you know. Uh, Obviously, there's something at stake there in that in, in that culture war. Yes, of course, um, of course. In the sense that you know we're talking about um, a law that is designed to marginalize um, non-Christians, immigrants, yeah. and non-Christians. Of yeah, course, non-Christians yeah, yeah. in general. Yeah. yeah, the people who don't like the Christians who don't really have any kind of like. Uh, sort of like religious like attire or like yeah, anything exactly. that they were on the regular, and it sort of affects like Sikhs. Muslims. Well, it's Christians. It's like, okay, if you wear a giant cross, then you're not allowed. Like, who does that? Yeah, no like, does that. But you're allowed, to, even if you're a, if a public employee, you're allowed to There's wear also, like a little one, which is just as like obvious a religious display. I mean, yeah, let's be yeah. let's be clear here. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. just it's an absurd double standard. Yeah, who doesn't think it's a religious display? It's like, oh, nice letter T, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, there is also that gigantic cross in the uh, National Assembly <laughs> that uh, the Duplicy government put up. But that's, of course, that's not the. Uh, that's not the church and state. That's yeah, a, and, and schools else. named Saint Enfant Jesus, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we could go on and on. Anyway, no, no, let's let's move on. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Something else I was going to say. Anyways, yeah, I think uh, it'll be interesting seeing uh, where Dini Codel goes with that. Um, mm-hmm. oh, no, there's something I want to say, but it's gone now. Let's uh, let's move on to topic. Mm-hmm. Uh, It'll come back after the 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 second Denny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. That's it. The other Denny will summon it. So, uh, in Drew, in the, Drew, you drive, right? I do. You ever had a car stolen? Uh, I confess that I have not had a car stolen. You ever stole a car? Uh, on what date? <laughs> <laughs> you put me on the spot here, Calvin. Um No, I have not stolen a car. All right. Well, uh, car thefts are up in Canada. Uh, I'm learning this uh, recently. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a big thing. Yeah. Uh, just uh, just at the beginning of uh, February, there was a like a an auto theft summit in Ottawa. It was sort of like a coalition of a bunch of different police forces across the country, uh, insurance companies, because obviously they're the ones who have to like now they're like payouts for car theft is going up and insurance doesn't insurance never likes paying out people. So they're quick on the ball with trying to organize no, something. No to, fun like, for them. Yeah. No fun for them. They're trying quick on the ball trying to organize something. So at this auto theft summit, it was insurance companies, uh, police uh, boards across the country, as well as uh, Canada Border Security Services Agency. Um, and they're all sort of talking about our, this. Fav- our favorite coalition. I know. I'm not. I'm not happy that these people are meeting. But like, it's an interesting. I guess. I mean, we'll, we'll get into this. But essentially, car thefts are up. Uh, the federal government announced uh, some extra money to Montreal. Uh, Valerie Plante is saying that. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> we'll get to that. Actually, Valerie Plante is saying some stuff to car thefts, uh, car thieves directly. But uh, first, let's um, <laughs> let me now turn yeah. to the car thieves <laughs> in the audience. <laughs> yeah, who's who's a car thief here? Um, yeah, let's just let's just watch the clip. Yeah. Uh, we have a, here we have a clip from uh, CBC News. So. Investigation takes us to West Africa to car lots and gas stations in the Nigerian city of Lagos. When did this one came to Nigeria? It came in December, December 4th. 4th of December, uh, two months ago? Yes. Our undercover researchers check vehicle identification numbers, run them through a website that lets you search for cars reported stolen, and we find many. This Honda is both made in and boosted from Canada. Check out the sticker from a dealership in Montreal. And can there be any doubt about this Lexus still wearing its Ontario license plate? A quick search confirms the crime. Back home, it hits home for people like Natalie Cara. Take me through it, like, when did all of this happen? That was a Thursday night overnight. Both my son and I were sleeping. We're watching her 2020 Lexus being stolen from her driveway. 
every day you can read somebody somewhere got their car stolen and sometimes you hear like three or four cars a night and i'm like this is not a joke what's happening how come it's so easy here's how easy natalie's car is stolen two more times after that when that all right well i'm glad i don't have a lexus that gets stolen three times i have to say I was thinking about buying a Lexus. Be, that would be somewhat I was thinking stressful. about buying a used Lexus, but no longer. Um, so, yeah, I think yeah. Uh, if we go to the next slide immediately. Yeah, so here we have it. Um, <laughs> if I have any plan to Montreal car thieves, you will be arrested. <laughs> Very direct. Uh, this is in Cult Montreal. This was published uh, February 22nd, 2024. Montreal Mayor Valerie Plante has issued a statement following the announcement of additional funding from the government of Canada to fight car theft and the dismantling of a criminal car theft network in Montreal. Uh, shortly after, what was it? Shortly after that one? No, it was actually the, the week prior to this uh, announcement, Valerie Plant. There was a story about uh, police seizing 53 stolen cars mm. at the Port of Montreal. And I guess uh, through all these pieces, through that clip we saw in uh, CBC News, I guess you, you, the, the, the picture is essentially like cars are being stolen at much higher rates. Insurance companies are having to pay these people out. These cars are ending up in uh, places like West Africa, places like in the video we saw in like Lagos, mm -hmm. Nigeria. Hilariously, cars from Longue are ending up there, which is like, that's like, <laughs> Longue, Longue on the map. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and I guess you have here a uh, Valerie Plant sort of like, I guess. Uh, who, who says Quebec doesn't have cultural influence around the world? Yeah, no, literally. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, we're, we're everywhere. <laughs> you got, we got Cajun out <laughs> we got stolen cars. And, uh, <laughs> our, our CRVs can be found like, in every West African yeah, yeah, state. Yeah. <laughs> an interesting uh, i guess w w when i hear this kind of news there's this i think about the sort of rise in car prices used car prices has been happening over the last few years that's usually something that people say ec uh, economists usually say like whenever like used pri car prices start going up that's usually like a sign of an economic downturn coming up um i think the car prices have been going up also because of supply and chain issues and the sort of like i guess mm. the uh efficiency of those have been sort of put to the test so the kind of the wait lists are long and usually when wait lists are long for buying new cars people start buying older cars used cars and that's why those car values go up but i mean across the board car values have been going up and i think it's sort of like i think of it as a sort of parallel to like like the housing crisis right mm -hmm. we have this thing where like the price of property and homes is going up and then people are treating it like an asset I think in a similar sense, because cars, of course, as like there are these big complicated machines, like uh, in, earlier in the video, we didn't see a clip, but they were talking about these like big rolling computers, right, nowadays. Yeah. The, those, those are incredibly valuable. And especially at a time when, uh, because of that value, people are sort of locked out of a certain car market, there's a need for them still. You know, the, like they're locked out of this kind of like the need for these vehicles because of the prices, but they're, the need is still there. And then these thefts start happening. And it does seem like these thefts are sort of uh, organized, right? It's sort of people who are... Oh, yeah. Uh, 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 who want to get these cars to, like, Lagos, Nigeria, which is, like, one of the fastest-growing cities in the world. I think it's, like, was, like, it must be, like, top, like, five uh, most populous places. Mm -hmm. uh, Nigeria's a growing economy. Uh, clearly a need for cars there. The prices are too high, so whatever networks are organizing to get these uh, cars over there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think when you have um, rising inequality and rising living costs, then you're going to get economic redistribution one way or another. But yeah, exactly. But crime is like the least efficient method of economic redistribution because it gets redistributed to a very small number of people yeah. who are willing to like transgress social norms and tear up the social fabric. Yeah. And then organized crime who are just like the, you know, the worst people. Not maybe not the worst people, but they're you know they're up they're up there with some of the pharma CEOs and stuff. Um, nice, that's the ranking. <laughs> <laughs> Mafia bosses, oh, uh, pharmacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> There's a little different ways you could look at it, but in any case, they um, you know they take their their cut, their their thirty percent or whatever it is to you know to pay off the port workers and the customs agents. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't know, it's easy to be pretty cynical about this stuff, you know, like, um, like they're, they're going to pay the federal, the feds are going to pay the Montreal police to, to like, you know, do some enforcement around this. Mm -hmm. It's like everybody who's ever reported a theft knows that the police don't do anything no, when you report a theft. It should have happened and show so, up after. And so they're, 
Yeah, they're gonna do nothing faster. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, what are they? <laughs> what are they gonna do? You know, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, three times zero is still zero. zero. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and and it's like, you know, uh, I don't want to like test our uh, test our, our our you know libel lawsuit representation here, but but when you hear about oh they found fifty three cars in the port, it's like. Okay, how did they find those fifty-three cars? Mm -hmm. Was it because there was a diligent investigation by, uh, you know, Detective, uh, um, you know, San Hubert or whatever, yeah, or yeah, yeah. or was it, you know, who was hitting the streets and, and you know, picking up cigarette butts and doing DNA tests, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, CSI Montreal style, mm -hmm. or was it because? Um, you know, somebody knew, somebody knows exactly where those cars are exact, and knows exactly who they are and says, okay, well, we got to, to keep, for us to keep our image up, you know, we're going to have to um, be able to, to, to show something. We're mm -hmm. going to have to be able to like uh, show some progress here. So can you, can you, you know, you're stealing hundreds of cars, but can you, can you give up a few containers so that we can like yeah, have yeah. something to put on the, on the evening news? Give some crumbs. The, the heat, the heat is on a little too high. We just need to, just need to take, take the heat off us sure. and make it look like we're doing our job. Mm -hmm. That's the more cynical version. I'm not saying that's what happened, but, um, true. Sure, that's a cynical take. Let's but everything we, certainly there's a, there's a, a large body of past experience with Montreal's police specifically mm -hmm. uh that would lead us to speculate in that direction shall we say um yeah. was there a, some point in the recent history in recent in the recent past when um that kind of corruption and payoffs and you know being and 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 um uh what's the word um complicity with with organized crime suddenly stopped being the case and they mm -hmm. started being a clean, you know, non-corrupt police force. It's possible. Mm -hmm. It's possible that that point happened at some point. Can we point to it? <laughs> uh, Charbonneau commission would mm -hmm. be, that was, that was the, that was, that was an opportune moment to, to sort of stick that pin mm -hmm. in the timeline. Right. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know what I don't know what goes on. I haven't yeah, yeah, yeah. done an in-depth investigation. Shrug. I can I can I can only speculate. Of course, of course. So it's one or the other. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think which, which which do we think is more plausible? D the detective San Hubert, uh, you know, diligently, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, swabbing windshield wipers back or, alleys. You know, yeah. just talking to people. Yeah, you know, exactly. Shaking people down. Yeah. yeah. Where's my Lexus? <laughs> Oh God! Yeah, um, I think there, there's like I think one of the uh, other sides to this is of course this kind of like extra money going to these police forces. Um, uh, I think someone in the in the uh, Global News article uh, can the auto theft summit put the brakes on rising crime? There's optimism. There's a uh, someone from the uh, I think it's, it's literally like this car theft like this international car theft like uh, awareness sort of uh, organization mm. that was talking about like. A of noble course. cause. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, I know. Like, oh my God. Let's this, this, this up there, I guess. Um, he was sort of talking about how he's very optimistic about this sort of summit because he's never seen this kind of level of like mm -hmm. inter organizational uh, meeting, communication, right? This, like, and to me, there's like, I don't like that. <laughs> to me, I don't like that because here, here you have these historically um, either corrupt, violent organizations. Uh, trying to find more ways to get money, right? Trying to find more ways to get money, more ways to get public support. And of course, not to say that like car thefts shouldn't be stopped. Of course, it's not to say that car thefts shouldn't be. Mm, mm, uh, I, I, it's not to say these car thieves should not be arrested or mm. anything like that. But it's like it's like none of these are. I, I find none of the solutions that are being put forward are anything near close to preventative, right? It's like, no. like we're saying the cops show up after it's done, and they show up after the cars have been sort of like stolen. This their sort of job is like to do this kind of half ass job of like um, finding the cars or sort of like being able to paint some kind of timelines. Like oh, they're in Nigeria now, and then what do we do about it? Anyways. People were talking about giving uh, Canada border security uh, more money, more resources. And I think if it does end up in less cars being stolen, I think good. But then now you hear you have these organizations that are already, for the most part, bloated, filled with cash. Now with even more cash and even mm -hmm. more kind of like government support. And also now they're no longer these like 
individual they're not acting like individual cells across the country in the term of like in terms of like 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 police departments but now they're sort of like all like they have these lines of communication with each other not to say that they didn't have that already but it's like those bonds are like strengthening and it seems like a coalition sort of forming to find a my lexus yeah i mean what we can say for sure is that they need to be seen to be doing something yes what we can say might be the case is that they need to actually do something yeah um so somewhere between those somewhere in the that gray area lies what's actually happening um i th- i think it's i think it's yeah it is important to note that like you know when people lose faith in the society they live in and they sort of you know um they 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 lose their sense of safety and they lose faith that the institutions around them are actually doing anything to help them um that doesn't usually help the cause of the left right, <laughs> of right, like right, right. redistribution of uh of greater social solidarity it it leads people to recoil um and i think i think what valerie plant's doing here is is trying to get ahead of you know denny coderre's old outfit you know yeah. um ensemble which who of course is going to press on this issue because this is the perfect middle you know people people who can spend thirty thousand dollars on a car can also spend you know a thousand dollars on a electoral donation of course and are much more likely to vote Mm -hmm. uh and so if you want to win an election you need those people on your side they're they're going to be the people absent a massive you know organizing push Mm -hmm. on uh at the at the level of the working class um that's going to be who is going to decide an election and on the island of montreal and so you need those people i think even on like a large scale now and like if we think about like if we think about like these the rise of like the auto dealership right because i think these are like Mm -hmm. to me i'm I'm always thinking about like these uh like the the kind of power they have right because like i think to me auto dealerships are sort of represent this sort of privatization privatization to three times charm privatization of uh this sort of like mm-hmm. what used to be like uh, like a public transport system right across the country with like with trains was sort of the main thing this kind of like thing that was uh uh for the most part held in common and like uh highways and car dealerships were the sort of way to sort of I guess disseminate that kind of money and power that used to be that whatever in a train ticket and like people riding together and it's sort of put into this sort of upper strata of that society where people can now afford their own cars, right? I mean, it's like, it, 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 there's like this whole thing about like, uh, uh, I guess like personal freedom that people got from it. But it's a crucial driver of like capitalist subjectivity. I mean, you- yes, incredibly it, so, especially it, it, in North America. It's a status symbol. It creates this like bubble of isolation around you that yeah. makes you feel separate from everyone else. That's why I want to control um, Exactly. I want to convertible, no, convertible for, so you can re- so you can feel political you can, reasons. You can commune. <laughs> yes. Commune with the populace. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. That sounds. Like I'm most, not in my prison cell. <laughs> so that's a good way to do it. Yeah. I have a, I have a sunroof. I'll uh, yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. commune with the we'll populace that way. Yeah. <laughs> no, but seriously, I mean, I think if you're taking the train to work, if you're taking a trolley, yeah. if you're if you're walking, even um, you have you a whole know, different relationship. Yeah, to yeah, so, you, like society. You're in a commons. Yeah. You're you're in you're in the same situation and you're you're visually and physically spatially orienting and identifying with the people around you Mm -hmm. there's a community there um but if you're in a car it's just like everybody else is an a-hole that you you know is cutting you off or or uh tailgating you or whatever they're doing you know in my day-to-day life i get the most upset when i'm in my car Mm. it's like i just noticed that about myself and it's like I don't think it's like I'm, I'm working on it, but I think there's something about that environment that really causes that, as you're saying. I, but I think even going back to the, this thing about like um, yeah, and that creates that subjectivity that, uh, that of that orientation toward everybody else that, right. that is fundamentally right wing. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say because we're talking about like you were talking about the supporters, right? That of Denny Codell's that let's say Valerie Plant is trying to like mm-hmm. sort of like trying to steal or trying to secure their support by saying this kind of stuff. I think it's also important to note, it's not just the... All her supporters, too. I mean, that's... The, uh, her, the, thing, the, her thing is the green cards, right? The kind of, like, the hybrids. Yeah. Or the, but, but that, you know, Proje Montreal has been actively going after the, that, like, middle-class vote. I mean, that's their... Of course, of that's, course. Even, even if that's not where they started, that's where they ended up. Sure. Um, and I think it goes back to what you're saying about Quebec politics. It's just, like, is it, you know, is it because it's impossible to mobilize, like... People like more working class people who are actually like paying rent and, mm-hmm. and you know, taking public transit. Um, 
Is they're just a lot harder to mobilize, and, and we don't know how to do that. We know, you know, there, there's a whole bunch of political consultants and, and operatives who know how to reach, you know, people who own CRVs. Mm -hmm. um, and the most so stolen vehicle in Quebec. The most stolen by far, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, I was, I was going to say, it's like you have uh, Valerie Plant sort of making this sort of effort. But I think it's also important to know how uh, Denis Coderre has the support, not of just like car, like drivers, but also of dealerships. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times, uh, uh, sort of uh, municipal governments have almost a lot of control over like, let's say the... Uh, the daily life of a driver, right? Yep. Like parking tickets and uh, sort of like roadways and stuff like that. And that's why dealerships, for the most part, will kind of like put their back behind them. And dealerships were, uh, were huge funders and sort of uh, behind the financial forces of Godel's party. And to me, yeah. this, to me, that's what I think about when I hear about this kind of stuff. And I think about this sort of, like if we think about that coalition of like dealerships and the sort of force that the like we think of them as this kind of organized kind of capital force, they're going to be putting their money behind Godel and then potentially maybe Valerie Blanc for these kinds of statements. Mm -hmm. That's at least that's those are the lines I'm thinking of. Yeah, that's, that's another aspect of the economic and political engine of yeah. of car production. Yeah, yeah, it's also something that that's like an asset. That's extremely expensive, but also depreciates very quickly. Oh, yeah, yeah. As soon as you drive it off the lot. Yeah. Then, yeah, yeah. yeah you've lost, like, however many thousands of dollars in yeah, value. Yeah. But um, They're not investments. <laughs> yeah, not in the least. Um, but but because it's something that depreciates and has to be produced over and over again, um, it's a great mechanism for keeping, for the sort of capillary action of capital sure. of yeah, yeah, yeah. keeping it circulating through industry keeping and it well oiled what was keeping, I <laughs> keeping the machine well oiled as it were yeah there you go, there you go. um yeah yeah i just like a dumb car i think cars have too much gadgets in them mm -hmm. now. we see in the video in the uh that video we showed initially there's like I think the CBC reporter was in LA talking to like people who are like hackers and they're just sort of opening cars up with like just these little mm -hmm. like, I don't know, like gizmos, right? And I think, I mean, that sort of adds, uh, I, I bring that up because we're talking about this thing about having this asset that is a car that is sort of like always in production, right? And mm -hmm. sort of because of that, because you always want to sell a new car every year or in every few like whatever, like cycles, you always want to like try to like What's the value add to this, right? Mm -hmm. What's the, how do we how do we do more for the consumer of this? And at the point it's at now, I think I mean cars are so complicated. Like I, I think this is the, even beyond just like a little like Montreal thing. I think there's there's something to the, I guess a a, no, con there, assume, a consumer kind of thing. No, there, I, there was a study the other day. I, I saw it go by. It was like the number of pieces involved in like fixing a car in a fender bender. Um, you know, used to be like I don't know. 20 or something and yeah. now it's like 120 yeah, which is and so it's like the cost of you know dealing with like a minor accident yeah. is is like thousands of dollars yeah. higher Just, yeah. and then that, that's more money for of course if you're like with the dealership the dealership gets that money for the fixes right then the money yeah. goes down for the whole supply chain that has to supply that kind of thing and, and all this like absurd level of digitalization which have, like they have like uh, bmws now like uh doing what tesla does which is like you pay like a thirty dollars a month to activate your seat warmers, yeah, yeah, yeah or something yeah. or whatever. So it's like they're trying to like squeeze all the revenue out. But of course, like if we were in a rational society, we Which would have not. simple, durable cars that have interchangeable parts mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. are heavily commodified. So it's easy to get them mm -hmm. and replace them. And like you, you know, just go to a machine keep, shop, they can yeah. just replace the part there. Yeah, you keep you keep it going for yeah. ages. And, and but now it's like oh, you don't have the the like. V seven S five two three chip. Yeah, yeah you know. Yeah. Oh, sorry, it's sorry. just the five two four. Uh, that's all we so have. So can here. I drive without it? Like, no, sorry, your, your car's kind yeah. of <laughs> your bricked. car's not going to work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, sure. Your car's kind of bricked because of that. Yeah. No, it's, it's sort of like I, I think of it the same uh, along the same lines as like. I mean, you see it less because like people are pushing against it, but like the sort of like proprietary stuff that like tech companies do, right? Where it's like like Apple, right? Like you need to use like Apple cables. You want to fix your like your phone, you got to bring to it like an Apple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people say that about Tesla. Right. I mean, Tesla sort of represents a combination of these two kind of worlds of like the tech world, because Tesla's more of a tech company than anything. There's uh, like completely uh, a tech company that whose stock value is completely overblown, uh, sort of combining forces with the auto world. Yeah. Not to say that auto the auto world is friendly with them, but there, there's this clear kind of like bridge there yeah, sort of absolutely. being built. Yeah. Yeah. Sh uh, shout out to my dad, who before he passed would would like he would buy like a used 79 Toyota pickup truck I love that. drive it until 
it literally fell apart and then traded in as a parts car for another 79 Toyota. That's <laughs> just so, kept, that's kept going. He, wouldn't go, he wouldn't go past 1980. That's I think he right. finally broke down and got a 1980 in like, you know, the late 90s. That's but, uh, but yeah, that was, that was his, that was his jam. Cause, so, Cause he could, you know, he felt like he knew how to fix them. He knew what hmm. the deal was. Their, their, you know, durables all get out and mm-hmm. you just, you know, you don't you don't want to deal with like chips and plugging it into no, computers and all this no, stuff. Course. I mean, yeah. this, and this is in the in the nineties, right? I mean, yeah. like it's obviously the, 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 the like the uh, uh, the complexity that's been added, that layered on since then, is just absurd. Yeah, yeah, you need to be like a computer scientist now to deal with some cars. Yeah, that's why. I mean, that's why I bought like I used to have this old like Jeep Cherokee. And I bought yeah. like I think if, if we're talking about like what my like year deadline is, yeah, like my, yeah. my cutoff, it's been two thousand three. Every car I bought has been either like my first one was like ninety eight, yeah. two thousand one, two thousand three. It was a Jeep, a Jeep Cherokee, Toyota Corolla, a Camry, and they're all super easy to work on. I worked yeah. on them myself. Yeah, yeah, Saves yeah. money. But then it's like cars don't, uh, not cars, companies don't want you doing that, right? Because it's like that you're sort no. of like, you, you get to exist outside of sort of their, the, the income flows. Their yeah, income they flows. want you trading in your windshield when your yeah. heads-up display starts having a pixel yeah, yeah, yeah. malfunction or something. Yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, speaking of machines... The future, uh, <laughs> robots. Uh, speaking of uh, five thousand years after we have eliminated the thinking machines. Speaking of and the, the Butlerian, Butlerian jihad. jihad. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, now we're we're uh, we're getting into. We have to backtrack and explain things to people. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Which is, I mean, that's what the show is about. It's about explaining things. Um, a new movie came out. By the name of Dune 2. Indeed it did. Electric Boogaloo. No, that's not what it's called. It's just called Dune 2. Um, the sequel to Dune came out recently uh, by Denis Villeneuve, a mm. uh, Québécois filmmaking legend. Really um, sort of on uh, an incredible run of films. They have not been... I he's, think the last seven he's a, episodes. He's a special director. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really incredibly talented. Um, and so like, you might be wondering, like, what does this have to do with, like, politics? Mm-hmm. You might be wondering that. You might be wondering that, dear listener. As they say in the meme groups, Dune is not political. <laughs> Dune, is not, Dune is not political, of course. Of course, Dune is not political. Dune is political. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Indeed. What do we got here? Oh, yeah. All right. So uh, before we before we play this, so here we have... Uh, so, yeah, Dune 2 came out. Uh, critics are loving it. People are loving it. Uh, highest, highest rated on Rotten Tomatoes ever. Ever, I think so. I mean, I, I don't like Rotten Tomatoes too much. People always, I feel like I always see like a ninety nine percent on that. This is like ninety nine point five. Whoa, <laughs> whoa, really, <laughs> really interesting. <laughs> the decimal points. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that is to say that uh, people have been enjoying it. Uh, I enjoyed yeah. it. I watched it. I liked it a lot better than the uh, the first one. I was, I wasn't really a fan of the first one. I'll be, uh, I'll be honest. But we can get into that later. So here we have uh, Denis Villeneuve. Uh, he made sure to. Uh, they had the uh, the premiere for Dune two. Uh, in Montreal. Mm-hmm. And uh, here we have a little interview with him where he talks about, uh, I guess, the Montreal influence uh, on the film or his perspective, or I guess, how he connects mm-hmm. his sort of upbringing and the things he grew up with uh, his directing of this film. Let's uh, watch this clip. Yeah. Yeah. What is it about doing that? Like, you're going to spend a decade of your life on this. Yeah. Yeah. It's a truly an obsession. There's something in that book that go speak deeply to my roots the uh, uh, the idea of a, of a young man that finds home and peace in another culture and and uh, the idea of, uh, of an exploration of the danger of blending politics and religion together and uh, the study of culture in relationship with their ecosystems it's all topics things that I was fascinated was I was a kid and that uh, still those themes stayed alive in in me why I, I, I still love uh, the book like that, uh, uh, it's mysterious, but every time I open the book, I have the same pure joy. The reality, when I, we, we, I wrote the, the screenplay uh, three, year, three years ago, four years ago, and uh, the actuality changed. We are in difficult times right now, and, but uh, uh, it is a movie about uh, a conflict and, and, uh, and the pressure of politics and religion, and it's like uh, what Frank Herbert, wrote the book inspired by the main currents of the 20th century and made projection in the future and sadly it feels more relevant than it used to be in the 60s so that's 
I haven't. Uh... The film is a statement about Gaza. Just say it, Denis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, Denis. <laughs> say it. He's he's always he's always in the Middle East. It's uh, kind of uh, mm-hmm. waiting for him to say that himself. I mean, called the fucking. Yeah, he seems to really have a. A connection to the Middle East. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, referring, of course, to Ansandi, which is his sort of breakout. Yeah, I mean, even in uh, success. I can't remember the name is the first feature that sort of won the Ernst Gag Prize when it came out. It was also in the desert. He sort of loves the desert. Mm-hmm. I think he talks about it being this place of like contemplation, and it's like I get it, I get it. But before we get into that, yeah, absolutely. Uh, he talks about the book. So this movie is uh, adapted from uh, the book, the first book by Frank Herbert called Dune in the Dune series. Um, there's a lot of those books. Tell us about the books, Drew. I know you're a fan. Um, I know, and also, you grew up in the same town, was it? Yeah, I grew up. I grew up a few, a few miles away from Frank Herbert, mm-hmm. um, who had like a he had he had a, a house in Port Townsend where he um, this is in Washington State where he uh, he was experimenting with like green energy and solar solar panels and all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. And he would spend a lot of time on the Quileute Reservation, which is like a indigenous nation. Um, on the on the Pacific coast there, um, and I also spent some time there. So, mm-hmm. how do you, do you feel that influence when you're watching the food, the movie or reading the books? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, Daniel Immervar, um, who's a really interesting sort of you know anti imperialist writer, author, um, academic, um, has done some really interesting writing about this. So, if you want to go down that rabbit hole, I definitely recommend his. His stuff. Um, What's his name again? Daniel Immervar. Daniel Immervar. Var is a is a W and then oh. W A H R. I think. I'm sure if you write, if you just do your best at typing Daniel Immervar, doing yeah, something yeah. will come the, up. G- Google will figure it out yeah, for you. Google, but, the <clears> machine <throat> will help you. <laughs> 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 the thinking machine. Um, so yeah, Dune. Uh, I, I feel like this is where we do a time lapse, and it's like three hours later, and I'm still yeah, explaining. Yeah. It. Um, <laughs> but Dune takes place ten thousand years in the future, and it's on this alien planet. And I think what I think is really remarkable about the book itself is that Frank Herbert creates this totally strange but somehow plausible mm. ecology. So he creates this whole, creates, um, you know, it's a desert planet. Um, there are these sandworms that are around and are very dangerous and they're gigantic, just gigantic and they'll yeah. just like swallow you up basically if you walk out in the desert, open mm-hmm. desert. Um, but they have a connection, mysterious connection to the spice, which is turned, as it turns out, part of the worm's sort of life cycle. Mm-hmm. Um, but also used by... Uh for space travel. Yeah, maybe. which also has these hallucinatory effects and life extending effects and so becomes this like precious substance all throughout the universe yeah, yeah. Uh, and 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 is the thing that enables space travel in the absence of the AI machines which humanity has like completely destroyed like 5000 years before because yeah. they were running amok. Yeah, I think the spice to me is sort of like if the tar sand if you could get high off the tar sands that's sort of like what it is to me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you could snort the tar sand <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. pretty much Yeah, would not recommend. <laughs> yeah. Not an endorsement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> the car theft stuff that's something else, but do not snort tar sand. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um Yeah, so he's created this whole universe and then and and then layered on top of that ecology is are these sort of People who are these sort of outcast wanderer types who have been, who have who have been expelled from different planets and mm-hmm. have tried to find a homeland and end up on this desert planet because it's the only place they can live, and have to make peace, have to like find a way to coexist in this like extremely hostile environment, mm-hmm. uh, and so it's this and 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 he goes into extreme detail about the sort of culture that develops in that context uh, and the relationship to the sandworms and the spice mm-hmm. and the relationship to the desert and the desert planet and how like someone, some people want to transform it. Some people, it turns out want to keep it anyway. There's, there's all these really interesting tensions that sort of come up in it. And it really does echo, I think his um, sort of understanding of the, of his life on the Pacific coast. Cause he, his life was riven with contradictions. He was, a mm-hmm. he worked for a log, logging company. This is the author of Dune, um, Frank for Herbert. a logging company. Um, and then his like good friend who's, uh, the, you know, this Quileute guy, um, wrote a book just excoriating the logging industry and how it had like, you know, you know, would dry up the forest ecology, which is obviously like these rich rainforests. Mm-hmm. Um, on the Pacific coast. And, and so Frank Herbert was like dealing with this 
inner contradiction while he's writing this book. So it, it's, it's, I think, I think those, those contradictions make it very rich. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also a sort of a rebuke of the white, of a sort of a white savior narrative. Um, and some people say that it, that it, um, reinscribes the white savior narrative. Some people say it successfully undermines it. I'll leave that to the audience to decide, but, but Denis Villeneuve, in any case, I, I don't think it's giving away too many sp- spoilers to say that he is leaning into that part that aspect of the book uh, as a central theme the uh, white savior or this sort of i guess this not i guess in the sense the of the book. critique of the white savior of course the critique yeah. of the white savior yeah. specifically like this white savior through like this religious kind of lens and the way they kind exactly. of summon that yeah. right yeah 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 i mean and and the manipulation based on stories and different things yeah, like that yeah yeah. yeah yeah absolutely absolutely um so that's yeah, that's my Dune take. But let's talk about Denis Villeneuve. I think. That's exactly what I was leading. Also, into. shout out um, also to Tanya Lapointe, who's uh, married to Denis Villeneuve and also a producer on Dune and a journalist, longtime journalist with uh, Radio Canada and a documentary filmmaker who made a film called Fifty Fifty about gender equality. Shout out Tanya, great job, <laughs> great job on all of that, and also being married to Denis. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, let's go to our next slide. I think we have a... Yeah, so here we have... So yeah, if we want to get into Denis Villeneuve's mm. um, sort of... Uh, how he... I guess how he posits his Quebecois influences towards this film. Of course, I am of the belief the the author is dead. Uh, intentions to... Uh, authorial intentions to me are sort of like... Mm, like, I'll consider them. But of course, for you, this show... You take a more Foucauldian sort of approach to the whole is, thing. Is that yeah. what he... I don't, I don't know. Is oh. that what he does? I mean, I won't get into <laughs> the theory about the I author. Do. I guess I do. Um, the author doesn't really exist, I think is the short version, but yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whatever, whatever that Foucault guy says, I agree with. Um, so here we have an article in Cult Montreal. Mm-hmm. Uh, Denis Villeneuve was on the cover of it. Uh, people are celebrating this big win for Montreal. People who go to UCAM are like, yo, like me and Denis Villeneuve were like the same mind, of the same mind in the same halls. Um, we, we sat in the same uh, same yeah, lecture yeah. hall in Judy Ju- Jasmine or whatever. We're eating yeah. Doritos at the same spot in the cafeteria. <laughs> His genius is my genius. <laughs> yeah, uh, soak it up. Uh, in this article by Justin Smith for Colt Montreal, uh, it's titled Denis Villeneuve's Quiet Revolution in Dune Part 2. Uh, we spoke with the Montreal filmmaker about drawing inspiration from the desert mm. and from a chapter of Quebec history that continues to resonate. Next slide, please. All right, so oh here we gosh. have. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> this is a mouthful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, this is my job now. All right, all right. <clears throat> so here it. we have an excerpt from the article. This is Denis Villeneuve uh, responding to Justine's question about uh, his sort of uh, background and how it mm-hmm. sort of uh, uh, takes. How I guess how he connects it to the film. Denis Villeneuve. I was born in 1967 when Quebec had just been had just separated from the church, and the intellectuals of the province were working to separate church and state. Before that, the church had a hold on politics in Quebec that was very unhealthy. Artists and young politicians with a refus global and what follows decided to break with the church and create a secular state. That idea helped me in my adaptation of and my approach to the people of this world in Dune, which is to say I didn't want them to be homogenous, that they'd have different sets of beliefs, different processes of thought, and that we have a youth movement that puts into question established dogmas that are still being embraced by an older generation. I had the idea that Chani, one of the characters of the film played by Zendaya, was a reaction against the alienation of this older generation and the religion of her elders, and that maybe it's a little bit like that generation in Quebec who are reacting against their parents. Mm. So... I guess uh, what Denis is trying to say here is the uh, Fremen in Dune are Quebecois. I guess to him. <laughs> I mean, that, maybe that's that, a simplification. That, 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 is, that, is, that is the conclusion of a yeah. lot of people on Twitter who yeah. are uh, making horrible fun of Denis Villeneuve yeah. for saying this. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, uh, but yeah. I see it. I see. I see. Like, I, I understand the sort of uh, the political threads he's drawing upon for this I mean, film. as a filmmaker, I think if you're going to really get into material, you have to find a ways to relate it to your own life. I think, and I think that's what he's talking about here. Like, you're, yeah. you know, yeah, you're yeah, finding yeah. ways to like, okay, I have this lived, you know, a deeper lived experience of what it's like to live in uh, a society that's, you know, casting off the reins of, um, 
organized religion, um, which is like a deeply oppressive Mm -hmm. force in Quebec society. Um, It's still, I mean, that kind of legacy is so often called upon still, right? It's like so deeply. I mean, even just in that interview we saw, like Denis uh, Denis Coderre, I'm going to mix them up. Denis Coderre was talking about like, you know, like the quiet revolution. He's trying to draw upon that history. He's talking about uh, Bill 21, which I'd say is still like a a sort of remnant of that kind of like uh, mindset, right? To like remove church and state. Of course, at this point, it's, I would say it's sort of a, mutated into a sort of uh baron harkonnen sort of figure but <laughs> it's uh it's the the the, the yeah. history is there the history is there yeah um you're gonna say um no i think i think i think that's it i mean um i'm, I'm curious what you th- what you think of 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 this uh this excerpt bef- i mean I, I i i've been talking to, uh for the last no, this morning and this afternoon, I was talking to some filmmaker friends just mm-hmm. about the sort of milieu that created Danny Villeneuve. So I'm going to talk about that, but but let's finish up with this. Yeah, actually, that's a, that's, that's really interesting. I'm uh, really interested to talk about that. But I, I guess, I mean, just to say, I, I, I sort of, like we're saying, right, like any kind of filmmaker, any kind of uh, uh, artist has to kind of draw upon their experiences. And I guess I see what uh, uh, Danny here is drawing upon when he's talking about, like, because, like, religion has uh, a huge role in this film. I think this film is much more sort of religious, uh, plays a lot more with the ideas of, like, prophecy and how people sort of, like, use that for these kind of, not necessarily, not necessarily nefarious things, but, like, it, they use it in, to sort of advance this kind of war, right? They use it to sort of, like, almost, like, capture, capture people completely. Like, I think one mm-hmm. of the characters, this is, like, maybe a little uh, spoiler, but one of the characters in the last film I find was much more level height in this one much more of a, a sort of like religious zealot of sorts, sort mm-hmm. of completely uh, enamored yeah, by this really idea. Yeah, they really played up that aspect of him. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see a lot of funny memes about him too. <laughs> you don't believe, but I believe. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. We are the believers. Um, and so I guess it's, it's, it's I wish, I can't, I'm kind of hungry for a harder connection that Denny wants to make with this because I find he's very careful when he's like, in that interview where he's like, you know, we live in difficult times, but like, you know, it's like... <laughs> We got to believe or whatever. I can't remember what he was saying specifically. I mean, if I had a critique of Dune 2 and again, trying to avoid spoilers, but um, it's to say that like it, it does sort of feel like an anti-colonial critique sort of processed by two sensitive white guys, you know, (laughs) like, because that's who wrote the script, right? Like John Spates and um, and Denis Villeneuve. Um, and I think that you lose you lose some depth there, but 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 you do. I think what you lose in depth, you might gain in popular resonance if mm-hmm. the box office is any indication. Mm-hmm. In the sense that you have, um, you know, these care. I mean, I, I feel like I recognize these characters a lot of them in terms sure. of like um, the archetype. The, the, yeah, the archetype of like the colonial critique, the true believer, like all these different things mm-hmm. are are sort of playing out, and 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 it's powerful to have the, your sort of little fragments of your lived experience sort of pulled out and made very bright mm-hmm. uh, on the big screen. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's real power to that. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm curious what kind of cultural effect it has. I mean, clearly Vilnov is very upset about what's happening um, in, in Gaza right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you see clearly, I mean, I, from the, just from the clip, um, I don't it, think it could have been clearer. But <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, he's also suppressing it because sure, he, sure, he's, sure. you know, he's a Hollywood, he's a Hollywood yeah, yeah, director. Yeah, yeah. So he's saying everything he can <laughs> say without, uh, you know, potentially upsetting. Mm-hmm. You know, Hollywood is all in for uh, team, Israel. team IDF. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. There's a, a list. <laughs> there, there's, there's a list a circulating. List. <laughs> there are many lists circulating. Yeah. Um, no, it's horrifying. But um, but I think within that context, I mean, I think he knows he has to, he, he's not going to take, that's not the stand he's going to take right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but but on the other hand, he's, he wants to hint at it as much as he can. That's mm-hmm. my sense anyway. Yeah, no, no. I, th- I think that kind of anti-colonial <laughs> stuff is like really interesting in the film. I think it's like incredible. Like he was saying himself, right? It's incredibly mm-hmm. relevant nowadays mm-hmm. despite like this kind of like gap. And I think that kind of, I guess, has... Uh, a lot to do with uh, Herbert's sort of like world that he's able mm-hmm. to draw upon these like real processes, right? I think before yeah. you were talking about the sort of interesting uh, uh, the culture stuff, right? There's this kind of like really interesting anthropological world in the yeah. film, but it's not just like I what I think what sets Dune apart from other sci-fi is it's not just like 
a fantastical world that's just purely like there's like a material kind of basis for like the culture, right? There's yeah, like exactly. A, there, there's exactly. like the, I think that's what like uh, people say like co- like communist leftist love doing because it's like uh, in comparison to Star Wars, this has like real like you see this kind of like 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 you like like I'm saying right, replace spice with oil and it's like still the same processes, right? Mm-hmm. You have this kind of like uh, rest of native population who are sort of around this resource that this colonial force is really trying to get in with their like machines, mm-hmm. their extractive. Uh, 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 tools and they need to either suppress them or kind of convert them to the cause and this is really interesting uh, dynamic at play. I guess. And what uh, what Daniel Immervar really pulls out is how Frank Herbert himself was a conflicted colonialist. Yes. I mean, he he yeah. wanted to be a colonialist yeah. basically. I mean, like he was made no bones about it. He wanted to like go and be like you know the sort of a superior colonizer basically mm-hmm. and like tell people what how to do things yeah. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. and how to develop their agriculture and stuff which is just like uh disastrous um and it was disastrous his mm-hmm. actual lived experience with that was you know didn't work failure <laughs> it went badly um <laughs> but but you can tell he's has he he understands that desire from the inside but on the other hand he's he's has developed that criticism through his friendship with these uh, you know indigenous people and so on so it's 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 um i think that's what makes it or it's, it's a, that's a nut in addition to what you said, which is, you know, the sort of material basis and the ecological, cultural, the eco-cultural sort mm-hmm. of milieu that he like vividly creates mm-hmm. um, that the, the sort of contradictions and and that that the lived agony of of those um, of of living you know, being a, a U.S. citizen really, mm-hmm. um, are, uh, are at the forefront there as well. So, and, uh, and, you know, timeless within our century, certainly. Of course. So we're talking about the kind of forces that sort of shaped Herbert and mm-hmm. his writing of Dune. Let's talk about the forces that shaped Villeneuve and the, I, I guess the road that he took to, uh, this movie. My compliments on, on the segue. Thank um, you, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. So Denis Villeneuve also was shaped, um, by social forces. And I think I've been sort of going into it for an article that I'm writing for the breach right now. Um, it's fascinating. Um, sort of what, you know, how, how do you, you know, um, I guess by contrast, if you look at the big sort of auteur, um, people, um, you know, auteur filmmakers who are at the top of the box office, uh, you have, you know, basically Christopher Nolan and maybe Greta Gerwig, uh, mm-hmm. who are up there. Otherwise, if you look at the like top grossing box office stuff, it's like, it's like, um, I don't know, Avengers 15, sure. um, Super Mario, uh, you know, two and a half, you know, it's just yeah, like, yeah, it's all yeah, this yeah. IP. Keep it's going. just like garbage. <laughs> um, I mean, I just, it just all blurs together of course, to me, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's just like, okay, yeah, let's get some people to recycle some brand, IP. Like, just, yeah, yeah, new, like, uh, intellectual property, I should yeah, say. Exactly. But yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, but, it, and it's just, it's just a big cardboard nothing. Uh, mm-hmm. Or it's like, a, you know, it's like, it's like watching movies, p- like picking from the candy store. Kind I, of like. I, I compare them to like, like processed ham, you know, it's just, it's just, yeah. it's just, it's just like, <laughs> Machine produces. Yeah, you throw, it, throw in a few quips. <laughs> yeah, the big set piece action scene, yeah, yeah. some like so many listers, extremely good looking people, yeah, and yeah, yeah. It, like serve it on a platter. Yeah, yeah. I want to um, hear a movie with ugly people. More, more, more slot, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, in any case, um, so so what 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 led to Villeneuve being able to develop to the point where he has this like very um, I think you know I think he's known for his sort of visual like real eye for stunning visuals. Mm-hmm. Um, I and, think people were surprised and, at how and his ability, low the budget was for yeah, this film compared yeah. to like, because people talk about like Marvel yeah. movies are, are like budgets for like 300, 400 million, right? And yeah. they look terrible because there's yeah. just kind of like overproduced, too much kind of green screen stuff where like, did they, Veneuve here, a sign of his authorship, like you're saying, is yeah. able to create a fair, a beautiful looking movie for much less the cost. He knows how to pick a director of photography as well. Exactly, um, exactly. Um, but yeah, lots of practical effects, mm-hmm. lots of very tasteful realistic looking cgi mm-hmm. um and and um anyway I, I could go into the movies more but i won't because i want to talk about Denis Villeneuve um and how he developed this style um and what sort of gave him the opportunities and so yeah if you contrast with someone like christopher nolan who's like you know the the son of like an advertising executive mm-hmm. um you know um Basically, if you look at you know who funded his first film with 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 Denis Villeneuve, it's like the National Film Board. It's like the publicly funded, um, 
you know, cultural institution that was an, in, an incredibly vital. It's sort of at the tail end of its vitality at, at, at the moment in the early 90s when when uh, when Villeneuve was getting out of film school. But nonetheless, it's still there and incredible. Yeah, it's still there mm-hmm. um, has been on the decline, I would say. Um, and certainly the f- people I've talked to say, um, but. Yeah, but but was they, that they funded Villeneuve's first film? Uh, he comes on the scene, then he like um, he makes a first feature, then he um, then he actually like takes a bunch of time off, has three kids, um, and and apparently works in the ad biz where you can like uh, you know do like six days of work, get paid very well. Yes, this is like a, a thing that um, yes Quebec <laughs> Quebec filmmakers apparently do. Yes, um, I have my friends do that. There I you mean, go. Sometimes I get some gigs. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So um, confirmed. <laughs> That's been fact checked. So, so it's a combination of like Quebec sort of you know commercial milieu, but also the the, the social democratic milieu, which um, and 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 also the sort of cultural ferment that he sort of gets dropped into when working at the NFB. He's you know there's like all through the 70s and 80s you have these like a really strong thread of like feminist filmmakers, like mm-hmm. the first. Um, Quebecois uh, woman to to direct a, f- a feature film happened through the NFB and she made a whole series of other films. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have, you know, people like Alani um, you know, um, Abenaki uh, filmmaker who made these incredible documentaries about indigenous struggles uh, all through the 80s. And, and um, he, Villeneuve would have shown up the year after uh, Kana Zadake, 270 Years of Resistance, mm-hmm. came out. Um so, um, which is her sort of, I would say, her sort of capstone achievement as in terms of cultural relevance, mm-hmm. um, although all her films are incredible. Um, so, um, yeah, so Villeneuve is, is, is dropped into this and, and also has been deeply influenced by the sort of Quebec feminist movement, I think. Mm-hmm. He's, he's mentioned this directly, but I think this propensity to really center strong, complex, uh, you know, female characters Mm -hmm. uh is really at the is is sort of his signature really i mean if you look at arrival or or dune 2 for that matter Mm -hmm. um uh, sicario yeah sicario um etc um yeah you 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 have you have this real approach that really is not the 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 sort of industry standard yeah certainly not a a favorite of christopher nolan for example yeah yeah. um but so so where 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 villeneuve is like fun is backed up by all these social democratic institutions christopher nolan just self-finances his first movie um and the sort of their career tracks proceed from there but um but i think it's also just like um i think his moment in the 90s when when there was all this support and there was also very cheap rent in montreal and so you could you could do a lot with a little when it comes to filmmaking. You don't mm-hmm. have to like, you know, now the rent's three, four, five times higher mm-hmm. uh, and you have to work multiple jobs to like, you know, put rent together. And so it's a totally different, um, totally different situation for so especially working class filmmakers mm-hmm. who don't have some kind of, you know, family support or whatever. Of course. Um, which Nolan had, as you're saying. Yeah. Well, in which Nolan was clearly that, you know, his talent is undeniable, but, um, but ha- the, but, the but, sort of mechanism that brought him up is yeah, exactly. incredibly the, private and not public, like didn't even nerves. Yeah, it's like Stephen Jay Gould said. It's like I'm not worried about. Um, I love that the, quote. The size of and and shape of, of, Einstein's, of, brain. of Einstein's brain, mm-hmm. but 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 all the people who are geniuses who never got to develop yeah, their working in sweatshops. Yeah, who are working in sweatshops. Yeah. Um, so, and it's the same thing. I think mm-hmm. Villeneuve. You know, if he was coming up right now. Would he, he might make it to Hollywood somehow, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but would he have developed this voice that's inflected by clearly by anti-colonial movements, mm-hmm. by uh, feminist movements, by working, by a whole tradition of working class filmmaking, mm-hmm. um, even though he's middle class, um, you know, these are all his influences that he, that he's sort of bringing with him uh, to the, you know, top of the international Elevate stage him. now. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so it's, it, it's an interesting sort of portrait of i think what has been um in terms of you know of, of the vital like how to create a vital cultural sort of moment um and also what could be uh you know because these policies aren't that expensive um you know the nf the national film board apparently is a sort of top heavy bureaucratic mess it's been it's been cut 
you know, by my rough calculations, it's been cut by like 25% uh, if you adjust for 2004 dollars. Mm. Uh, if you just if you just for inflation, it's been cut by about 25% since the 90s. But it's but 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 the the decline of its relevance is the real main story. Um, would, would you say that the cuts to the NFB, this sort of uh, a little, I would say, much more challenging, I guess, public funding for uh, cultural funding model right now do you think that makes for a more difficult time to find the Denis nerves that exist right now yeah i just think it's more less likely that they emerge you know sure. they they just have to be that much more driven and passionate and mm-hmm. dedicated and willing to like stretch themselves use their parents money <laughs> yeah or use their parents money um but but that's you know you that's that's narrowing significantly the pool of people mm-hmm. that might may or may not be talented mm-hmm. um and so yeah there's been studies done in the uk where they say like yeah the number of like people of working class origin who are um in the artistic world basically um writers um filmmakers actors musicians uh has declined has been cut in half basically mm-hmm. in the last like couple decades of course. Uh, and it's down to like 7.5 percent and of course the working class is the vast majority of people mm-hmm. who live in the uk but they're only 7.5 percent of artists you know working artists mm-hmm. um and then that in turn gets reflected in the art that's made yeah as well a certain perspective is shown that's not usually a working class one yeah so so object just just on a statistical level the, you, you're getting less talent mm-hmm. because It, because you're only selecting from the smaller pool of people who have, you know, parental support or, or industry connections or whatever it is mm-hmm. that gets them in the door and gets them, um, gets them doing the thing. Um, but then you also, yeah, you also don't get that, that the, the range of human experiences mm-hmm. and, and the societal relevance, frankly, uh, is much lower because, you know, you're, you're just talking about the, you're much more likely to see a film talking about the sort of like, I don't know, exploring the emotional foibles and and uh petty obsessions of upper class you know rich kids than oh, yeah. you are um to have something that's deeply resonant on mm-hmm. a on a social as well as psychological level sure, sure, like sure. maybe you still get the psychology but it's still it's still constrained i think by that yeah. class position because at one end you have like a movie like i daniel blake and then at the other end you have like something like i don't know love simon Have you seen? <laughs> I confess, I haven't seen the latter, so I don't that's know. Right, that's right. But uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean, you're you're uh, yeah. yeah, you're 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 not you're not reaching and you're not resonating. I think I think the art's not resonating as much mm-hmm. uh, as a result. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I guess it's, it's it's interesting point. I guess you're bringing up that the nerve had like sort of like this really rich, fertile kind of like public. These public institutions, right, that supported his sort of mm-hmm. ascension and also his talent, right, and supported all the people around him, of who, course, yeah. who yeah, influenced yeah, yeah. them, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. a film is, of course, not one, uh, not just one person, but like the whole crew. Oh, his influences, yes, of course, yeah, of course. Well, his well. influences, but also the the yeah, the, all the you know the yeah, like you just said, there, a film is a giant team, and yeah. you and when you when you assemble like a a team that's aligned and has has vital debates and um and and is really engaged with ideas on the sort of fundamental level like yeah of course it's going to be a better film probably you know like that's i would imagine absolutely absolutely i remember what i wanted to say about denis Coder. bring it one time i was working uh as a wedding videographer for this awful man whose name i will not say I almost said it. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, hard. It's hard. It was it was the wedding of this it was like the wedding of the niece of the guy who owns the most Canadian tires in Quebec. Don't say it. Don't say it. I don't know who. But I just okay, that's, sure. that's sort of all I remember. And so this is like happening at like Celine Dion's golf course. Nice. And there's like a bunch of whispers. They're like, I think she's gonna be here. She wasn't. But then Denny Godel shows up. <laughs> like during like during the reception, he shows up shake some hands, make some speeches, and then he was out of there. And that's my one uh, experience with Denis Coderre in person. Yeah, I mean, he, he described himself like that. He's like, yeah, I like people. I like, you know, he likes to get in there and mix it up. And then, you know, it's... it's He's uh, efficient. I mean, you, ha- you, you, have to, you have to love it, you know, if you're, if you're in that situation. On uh, that note, 
Yeah, I was gonna get into Denny Quitter and uh, oh. and and uh, the, the 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 like destruction of Haiti's democracy, but maybe oh, maybe for another, another time. Episode. That's another episode. That's, <laughs> a, that's another two hours. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Drew, for coming on, uh, sharing uh, your opinions, your takes on these uh, issues. Uh, I really, I I, I think I, that what, what you painted about the uh, the sort of public institutions that supported uh, Villeneuve, and as well as his influence, I think is gonna stay with me. So thank you for that. Great. Well, thanks for having me. Of course, of course. That's our show today, folks. No hello goodbye lines today. Only goodbye b- b- by lines. I don't think that works as much as I thought it would. Take care of yourselves. Thank you for listening. Thank you to the crew here. And uh, have yourselves a wonderful week.